A center of excellence, a nurturing space for innovation, creativity, and academic freedom. This is the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. As a constituent university of the University of the Philippines system, UPLB is a leading national higher education and research institution in various niche areas. Grounding itself on the needs of national development, UPLB cultivates well-rounded and critical leaders who are ready to lead breakthroughs and innovations. Through its industrial and academic partnerships, UPLB propagates its gains to advance inclusive development in various sectors. An educational institution that upholds honor, excellence, and public service. A center of knowledge, innovation, history, culture, and biodiversity. This is the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. UPLB found its home at the foot of the legendary Mount Makiling in Los Baños, Laguna, a short distance from Laguna de Bay, the country's largest lake. It has its beginnings in 1909 as the UP College of Agriculture, a tent school for a handful of students. A year after, the Forest School, or what was to become the College of Forestry, also set up its home in Los Banos. In 1972, the UP College of Agriculture and the College of Forestry that had by then become renowned institutions were granted full autonomy as the University of the Philippines Los Banos. Instruction, research, and extension in agriculture and forestry in the country took root and flourished in UPLB. Through its strength in these two fields, UPLB established niches in various areas, biotechnology, engineering, veterinary medicine, natural resources conservation, environmental science and management, human ecology, food science, economics and management, public affairs, and development communication. It drew its strength in the arts and other fields of science from harnessing its expertise and human resource in the biological, physical, and social sciences. Today, UPLB degree programs continue to dominate over its counterparts. Over the years, UPLB has developed graduate programs that continue to attract students far and wide including collaborative programs with international universities in food security, biodiversity conservation, and development. To make graduate programs more accessible to professionals, UPLB offers them off-campus. Recently, UPLB established the UP Professional School for Agriculture and the Environment in Mindanao, the country's food basket, in order to help build the knowledge capital that the country needs to attain food security. Instruction in UPLB is enhanced by a strong and vigorous engagement in research and public service that enables it to produce knowledge and generate technologies and innovations that promote sustainable living, making it a strong force in the war against hunger and poverty in the country. Extension and public service are the mechanisms by which UPLB brings this knowledge and technologies to the people, as well as for it to know what they need and to help shape policies in the country. UPLB's reputation as a graduate and research university was formed through the continuous aspiration for excellence and the mutual reinforcement between instruction, research, and public service and extension.
It brings in partnerships with local and international universities and provides mobility to faculty members, researchers and scientists, and students and enhances their competitiveness. Instruction, research, and extension and public service in UPLV reflect the dynamism, honor, and excellence that its forebears set as a standard for its leaders to aspire for. is in a constant state of change now more than ever. It's a world that requires resilience, flexibility, and innovation to overcome challenges and to pursue growth. That is why the University of the Philippines Los Baños is pursuing future-proofing initiatives to provide agile leadership and develop local and global communities amidst shocks and disruptions in an ever-changing world. Guided by compassion, an openness to working together, and a daring to seek out breakthroughs, UPLB constantly pushes for academic excellence, produces relevant research, establishes academic and industry partnerships, and cultivates creativity, critical thinking, and innovation. To keep up with the fast-changing world and to strive for inclusivity in development, UPLB seeks to level the playing field and expand avenues for acquiring new knowledge. It is reshaping the learning experience, enabling students and educators to continue with the learning process in vastly different learning conditions. It is expanding its academic programs and supporting initiatives to create a conducive learning environment. To address the growing complexities of modern problems, UPLB continues to break barriers across disciplines to produce cutting-edge innovations and solutions that serve the needs of various communities. It is taking on challenges in food security and sustainability and coordinating research efforts to direct the university's resources toward critical research areas, making sure that the university-generated knowledge can reach its intended stakeholders and be applied to real-life contexts. UPLB is dedicated to its commitment to contribute to public good and social welfare as it continues to work with the local government and the community to address their most pressing needs. Amidst its engagements, UPLB remains as one of the top regional and global universities and continues to be recognized in the country and across the world. As the national university, UPLB aims to be a steadfast partner in development as a producer of new approaches that minimize the cost and impacts of future shocks and by honing leaders committed to knowledge creation, innovation and cutting-edge research, and public service. This is UPLB's roadmap to be an impactful institution in a constantly changing landscape. Responsive, innovative, future-proof.
College of Public Affairs and Development of the University of the Philippines Los Baños is a premier academic institution committed to the study of development issues, institutions, and communities. Created on January 29, 1998, CPAF upholds the value of transdisciplinary and participatory approaches in honing distinctive excellence in development studies and governance. With its one faculty, one college structure, the College of Public Affairs and Development aims to develop human and institutional capacities through its instruction, research, and public service programs in the following areas. Development policy, governance, and community and rural development. Serving as the instruction unit of CIPAF, the Institute for Governance and Rural Development or IGRD houses all faculty members and serves as home to all academic programs of the college. Under the IGRD, CPAF offers graduate degree programs that equip students with the knowledge and skills needed to become competent and proficient development practitioners, leaders, and managers, administrators, educators, policymakers, and researchers. These degree programs include Master in Public Affairs, Master in Development Management and Governance or DMG, Master of Science in DMG, and MS and Doctor of Philosophy in Community Development and in Extension Education. CPAF also offers the PhD in Development Studies or DVST, a cross-disciplinary program. The major streams of this program include Agrarian and Rural Development Studies, Agriculture, Food and Nutrition Security, Education and Development, Natural Resource Management, and Population, Gender, and Development Studies. Moreover, the College offers undergraduate service courses in Education and Agrarian Studies. Students enrolled in these courses are mostly taking up B.S. Math and Science Teaching, B.S. Human Ecology, B.S. Development Communication, and B.S. Economics. With students coming from diverse national and cultural backgrounds, graduate education at CPAF fosters a learning environment that encourages students to become co-creators of knowledge through research, program, and project evaluation, seminars, workshops, community planning, and other course requirements. Students' learning and knowledge sharing are also extended to local communities and institutions. The different organizations in CPAF also offer opportunities for students to build continuing personal and professional camaraderie even beyond their student life. The CPAF Graduate Students Association is the official student organization of the college. Meanwhile, the CPAF Alumni Association is the organization that keeps students connected after their graduation. Together with instruction, research and public service are the key functions of CPAF. The college has two research centers, the Community Innovation Studies Center or CISC and the Center for Strategic Planning and Policy Studies, or CSPPS. 
the CISC conducts integrative community development studies in the areas of community education, development pathways of communities in transition, and community-based strategies for sustainable development. On the other hand, the CSPPS serves as the policy and advocacy unit of the college that centers on social policy and institutions, water and development, and agricultural policy and sustainability. Policy seminars are also conducted regularly to bring timely and relevant information closer to various sectors of the society. Through its research programs and projects, the two centers have been working with communities, local government units, government agencies, non-profit organizations, and the academe toward achieving the common goal of developing the potentials and capacities of people and institutions. Research outputs are published in various publications and presented in local and international academic gatherings, including the International Conference on Governance and Development, a biennial event of the college. The Knowledge Management Office produces a refereed journal, the Journal of Public Affairs and Development, a newsletter, SIPAF Updates, and a magazine, SIPAF in Focus, which are all available online. Through print and online media, the college was able to disseminate research outputs and relevant college activities. The KMO also manages the college library and its computer laboratory. Together with its students, faculty and staff, alumni, and institutional partners, CPAV is committed in pursuing future-proof systems in instruction, research, extension, and policy advocacy with distinctive excellence in development studies and governance for nation-building and inclusive development. Everyone, I am Danica Amor M. Domingo from the Center for Strategic Planning and Policy Studies, and I will be your host and moderator for this afternoon's event. Welcome to the Roundtable webinar on research ethics. So this webinar is part of the pre-conference activities that we have lined up for the upcoming third International Conference on Governance and Development. This is also co-organized by the Development Innovations and Policy Laboratory of CSPPS, the first AANR policy laboratory in the Philippines. So ICJD is a biennial conference where students, academics, and industry experts meet to discuss emerging issues and participate in plenary discussions on good governance and societal development. So the third install, installment of the ICGD will be an in-person conference that will be held 
on July 2023. And we have started the pre-conference activities uh, that kicked off with the Student Research Poster Contest and now this program on research ethics. So today, this afternoon, we have invited academic institutions to talk about their policies on research ethics and challenges in implementing them. So this is for institutions who are just starting to craft their policies and of course for researchers. So before we move on, let me first share our house rules. Kindly turn off your cameras for the duration of the program unless you are asked to turn it on and kindly keep your microphones muted. And now, finally, to formally open this program, may I call on the Dean of the College of Public Affairs and Development, Dr. Rowena D.T. Bakongis. Thank you, Danica. Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. It is with a grateful heart that I welcome everyone to this roundtable discussion on research ethics. We do not only have one, but five experts who will speak about this topic. We are very happy to learn from all of our speakers who will be properly introduced later. Having a common understanding of what is right or wrong in the conduct of research in a particular field of specialization is highly important. Knowing the norms positively contribute to the improvement and recognition of our researches. Something that all of us actually aim for. Publication and citation are something that are key indicators in the university rankings and for 2022, the Global Innovation Index. For citation, Philippines rank only 55, 55th out of 132. Subjecting our researchers to an ethics board is important as some journals require an ethical board review to consider your article for review. We see research ethics this webinar as an important part of the pre-conference activities of our third international conference on governance and development, which will be held in July of 2023. We are aiming for the publication of the best papers that will be presented in the Journal of Public Affairs and Development. UPLB just recently finalized its, its research ethics policy. And our students who are here, and I can see some of them, including the faculty advisors, will be very happy to hear about the policies and procedures. Let us all learn together this afternoon as we aim to improve our researches. Once again, welcome and happy learning. Magandang hapon po. Thank you very much, Dean Wang. So moving on with our program, let me finally introduce our first speaker for this afternoon. So our first speaker, Dr. Maria Carmina C. Manuel, is currently an associate professor at the Institute of Biological Sciences of the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. In her home unit, she handles subjects on genetics and has produced several publications and garnered several awards, including the 2019 UP Gawad Pangulo Award for Excellence in Public Service. She is also a member to a number of professional societies. In 2022, this year, she started serving as the chair of the UPLB Research Ethics Board. According to her, the integrity of the research involving human participants is anchored not only on the scientific foundation of the study, but equally on ethical standards that help protect the rights, welfare, and dignity of persons. The quest of truth in research should always be balanced and guided by ethical principles that uphold the primary of persons. So ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Maria Carmina C. Manuel. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm Maria Carmina Manuel of the UPLB Research Ethics Board. This afternoon, I will be sharing about research ethics policies and implementation, the UPLB REB experience. 
The UPLB Rev is currently composed of 18 regular members, three lay members, and three non-affiliated members. Tasks of the current board include the following. First, to review and approve technical and ethical acceptability of research proposals involving human subjects. Second, to monitor the progress and completion of implemented research and exercise appropriate action should there be substantive ethics flaws. Third, to conduct training on research ethics, especially for UPLB constituents. And fourth, to ensure adherence of the university's review framework and policies to professional, international, national, and institutional guidelines and best practices. The World Health Organization stated that research ethics governs the standard of conduct for scientific researchers. As such, all researches involving human beings should be reviewed by an ethics committee to ensure that the appropriate ethical standards are being upheld. The ethical principles that should be uh, upheld uh, for studies involving human participants should primarily include respect for persons, justice, beneficence, and non-maleficence. The UPLB Rev initially started as the UPLB Institutional Ethics Committee. It was later on renamed to the UPLB Ethics Review Committee. And in 2019, we initially submitted the documents for accreditation to the Philippine Health Research Ethics Board. We received the FREB initial assessment in 2020, and in 2021, uh, we were able to comply with the FREB assessment and uh, did revision of the SOP, recruitment of additional members, and then the change of the name to the, to the UPLB Research Ethics Board and meetings with uh, FREB reviewers. And in 2022, we were able to submit the revised SOP manual and FREB forms. The board was granted accreditation as level one uh, REC last September 22 of this year. Here is the UPLB REB's organizational structure. The UPLB REB is under the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research and Extension, which is directly under the Office of the Chancellor. The UPLB REB is headed by the chair and assisted by the coordinator secretariat. And there are three independent panels for review. So we have panel one, panel two, and panel three. Now the serious adverse event panel can be put up as needed. How is the ethics review process carried out? First, we had the establishment of the UPLB Rev website last August 2022 with the help of the UPLB Information Technology Center or ITC. The website helped increase the visibility of the board and it provides information about UPLB Rev requirements, forms, and some guidelines that can help uh, those applying for ethics approval, particularly our graduate students whose protocols uh, we have started reviewing this school year. There are three independent review panels. Panel one deals with protocols involving social sciences and humanities. Panel two for protocols under applied social sciences and panel three for protocols involving physical, biological, and engineering sciences. Review panels are 
host of members of various backgrounds and of different perspectives. At least uh, there are five members of which three are regular, one non-affiliated or non-institutional, and one lay member from the community. So this complies with the guidelines set uh, by, the, uh, by FREB. And this is also uh, stipulated in the National Ethics Guidelines for Health and Health-Related Research. There are three possible types of review. A protocol may be classified as exempt or expedited or full board. And the criteria are listed as to which can qualify for each type of review. So for example, a protocol dealing with publicly available information or observation of people in public places can be classified as exempt. But first, uh, the, the protocol would still need to be submitted to the board and um, reviewed by the board for it uh, if it really qualifies for exempt, um, uh, uh, for being exempt. And then those expedited are those protocols with low or minimal risk, do not involve vulnerable populations, and other criteria as listed. Those protocols that involve more than minimal risk or those which involve vulnerable populations or those which do not qualify in either for either exempt or expedited review, they would fall under full board review. So as example, as an example, we have the clinical trials. But currently, with the level one accreditation, we're only allowed to review protocols that involve low or minimal risk. Um, the OC memo 2022, number 89, allowed the board to start reviewing um, the protocols of graduate students. So uh, this include uh, thesis, dissertation, or field study proposals. The documents required include the following. Number one, a cover letter. Number two, Form 2B or the application form. Number three, Form 2A or the review checklist. Number four, the approved uh, thesis, dissertation, or field study proposal. Number five, study protocol assessment form or Form 2C uh, as shown here. The study protocol assessment form lists down the important uh, aspects or components of the study protocol. In addition, there is the diagrammatic workflow for the data and the data collection forms, the CV of the principal investigator. So currently, these are the UPLB graduate school students. And then we have the informed consent assessment form or form 2D the informed consent form in English and in the local language. Here is an overview of UPLB Rev Form 2D, which lists down the essential elements of an informed consent. So some of this may be uh, applicable. Most of these are applicable, but some may not be applicable to a given study. In addition, there should be the basic research ethics training certificate of the principal investigator and the recruitment advertisements as needed by the study protocol. A printout and a soft copy or e-copy need to be submitted to the chair of the UPLB Reb, care of the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research and Extension or OVICLE. Here is an overview of the ethics review process flow. It starts with the submission of documents, the screening for completeness, and if some documents are lacking, 
the principal investigator is informed to complete the documents. So there is the submission of these requirements. And then um, the study can now be classified as to whether it's going to be exempt from review or it's for expedited review or for full board review. So the working days are stated or listed here on this diagram uh, and it indicates the number of days given to the board to act on the particular protocol. Now the results of the review are communicated to the chair and the coordinator, which help transmit um, this uh, results to the principal investigator. So usually uh, there, there are going to be modifications required prior to approval. And once these are satisfied and uh, complied with, then the board will now be able to issue a certificate of approval. If it's exempt from review, a certificate of exemption is given. Now, what are the growth points and targets that the board considers? Um, first, information dissemination. This will be uh, in the university and this will help increase awareness on the significance of the ethics review process. In addition, this will help enhance a research culture that adheres to ethical standards. Next would be uh, recruitment and training of members or additional members. This will help increase the number of independent review panels in order to, to accommodate the volume of um, protocols for review. So in addition to the student protocols, the board eventually will also be reviewing uh, research proposals from faculty, reps, staff, and other employees. Uh, and this is true for studies that involve human participants. In addition, um, we are also proposing to request for logistical and manpower support, such as or including the following allotted budget for UPLB rep operations, uh, an office space. Uh, we, ha we have already been granted this one. And then dedicated UPLB rep staff. So altogether, this will help in the smooth operation of the UPLB rep. Let me end this presentation by sharing this personal insight. The integrity of research involving human participants is anchored not only on the scientific foundation of the study, but equally so on ethical standards that help protect the rights, welfare, and dignity of persons. The quest for truth in research should always be balanced and guided by ethical principles that uphold the primacy of persons. So with this, I end, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Manuel. So from Dr. Manuel's presentation, um, she was able to share how the Ethics Board of UPLB started um, way back in 2015 and newly accredited this year, 2022. And she also shared some protocols and the process that the university follows. And um, moving forward, um, the UPLB Research Ethics Board aims to also increase um, awareness among the constituents regarding the ethics review process of the university. So now let us move on to our second speaker. So our second speaker, Dr. Janet Alexis Aparillo de los Santos, holds a bachelor and advanced degrees in nursing. So she is a registered nurse and is currently an associate professor of the College of Nursing at Visaya State University. She has produced several publications and has recently been awarded as Distinguished Health Researcher in Region 8 by the Eastern Visayas Health Research and Development Consortium. So like our first speaker, Dr. Manuel, Dr. Apurilla de los Santos also heads the Ethics Review Committee of VSU. And from her own words, the research ethics in the academe is important because it reflects the integrity of our work 
as we expand knowledge while preserving the dignity of our participants. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Dr. Janet Alexis Aparillo de los Santos. Hello everyone, I am Janet Alexis A. de los Santos, an Associate Professor of Nursing and the designated Chair of the Visayas State University Ethics Review Committee. I am here to present the establishment of our own Ethics Review Committee in our university. The outline of my presentation will be as follows. First, I will discuss overview of VSU academic offerings, the challenges encountered, the VSU ERC humble beginnings, and our ways forward. First, I am going to present the history of Visayas State University. The institution was established on June 2, 1924, as the Bye Bye Agricultural School through Provincial Board Resolution. In 1934, it was renamed Bye Bye Agricultural High School and was later converted into the Bye Bye National Agricultural School or BNAS with the approval of Commonwealth Act No. 313 in 1938. BNAS was converted into the Visayas Agricultural College by virtue of RA No. 2831 issued on June 12, 1960. The institution attained rapid growth and development following its conversion into Visayas State College of Agriculture on May 24, 1974 through Presidential Decree No. 470 and amended by Presidential Decree No. 700 on May 12, 1975. In 1999, four institutions of higher education in the province of Leyte were integrated into the college to create a five-campus VISCA system. VISCA became latest state university through RA number 92158, issued on August 11, 2001. LSU became Visayas State University on April 27, 2007, by virtue of RA number 9437. The Visayas State University is composed of five campuses with VSU Bye Bye as the main campus and other four campuses situated strategic municipalities in the island of Leyte. Each of the satellite campus are offering various curricular programs. For main campus alone, there are eight colleges and around 35 departments where some of the program offerings are requiring theses involving human subjects. It was 2007 when CHED released the Memorandum Order No. 37 in the implementation of graduate programs, particularly on the requirement for theses involving human subjects to undergo review and clearance from an ethics review committee, and we have not been compliant on this. It was a challenge for VSU to secure Certificate of Program Compliance, or COPC, for its various graduate programs, which is a requirement for our ISO accreditation. We have not been compliant to existing international and national policies on the conduct of research, such as the National Ethical Guidelines for Research Involving Human Participants, which somehow taints and questions and raises questions in the integrity of our research outputs. As such, faculty researchers experience being rejected in our results dissemination. We were not accepted to present re research findings to some conferences or fora because ethics clearance was a main requirement. Much more to have this hard work published in refereed journals. We experience desk rejections, especially among high impact journals mainly because the research did not undergo um, ethics review. The faculty settled for journals with lesser impact and it somehow is uh, shortchanging the science produced by, uh, by our highly capable faculty researchers. It was also a challenge to form the review committee. People in the university had varying understanding on the roles and functions of an ethics review committee. It was like pregnancy on labor. Up until uh, just this February 2022, 
the University Ethics Review Committee was finally given birth. It was also a challenge based on the selection of potential members. As based on the guidelines, um, the members of the committee shall not be senior decision makers of the institution. Hence, the university scouted and arrived to a decision to compose the team from multidisciplinary sciences and with representative from outside of the institution. Um, the committee is composed of nine members, including a medical doctor, food nurse, scientists, sociologists, an expert in education, biotechnology, food science, and development communication. We also have an invited community representative as member of the team. Considering that the members hail from different departments in our big university, um, gathering for a meeting is another challenge uh, because of our uh, conflicting schedules and our heavy workloads. But nevertheless, the committee is on its full commitment to meet and function accordingly to what is expected from us. As a newly formed committee, we did our benchmarking activities soon after we were formed. We visited Salmar State University, which has its own functional ethics review committee to benchmark our operations and procedures. Some members of the committee participated in the uh, training for SOP formulation in order for us to have our own SOP manual. And here we anchored most of our forms and operations procedures from the 2020 FREB SOP guidelines. Our uh, proposed SOP were finally presented to the University Administrative Council March 2022. This was finally approved by our BOR this June 2022. We acknowledge that some of our members in the committee have no background on ethical review process. Since then, we have sent our committee members to trainings in ethics to equip them with their roles and expected functions and responsibilities in the committee. We have received trainings from our consortium and the UP Manila spearheaded trainings in ethics review and protocol writing. In our calendar, we streamlined our activities in the, um, in the committee for our eventual full swing first quarter of 2023. We have uh, started the dissemination of the new policy to faculty and student researchers, and we have introduced the policies to several department heads in the main campus by providing them a copy of the ERC SOP forms and guidelines. And uh, at present, we are initiating the implementation of these policies in our home department, and that is the College of Nursing, where we have introduced the process, the forms for our students to comply. The challenge we see based on our initial implementation is how to make the researchers see the review process as something that is helpful rather than viewing it as another layer of scrutiny and delay in the conduct of their studies. Um, we are also looking forward to having our UERC accredited by the Philippine Health Research Ethics Board soon after we have complied with the minimum requirements. And that ends my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. For your queries, uh, you can email me uh, use, uh, following the email projected on your screen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Janet. So from um, Dr. De Los Santos' presentation, we found out the challenges that they have encountered, especially in conducting research. They could not present or they could not publish um, their research involving human subjects, for instance, because of the lack of ethics review. So with this, we um, know that the, the, there is the importance of having an ethics review process in the academe po, ano? and it's good that VSU has already started um, conducting po this ethics review process. So now let us now move on to our third resource speaker. So our third speaker hails from the Bicol region. So when we were organizing this event, we wanted our resource speakers to represent different regions in the Philippines. So we have invited from Luzon, um, Visayas, and Mindanao. So 
And now let me introduce Dr. Ramona Isabel S. Ramirez from the Central Bicol State University of Agriculture. So she specializes in chemistry and has been the OIC Dean of the College of Development Education and Chairperson of the Department of Natural and Applied Sciences. Currently, she is a professor at the College of Development Education and is serving as the CBISWA Vice President for Research and Innovation. So according to her, ethics promote respect towards society and others. So finally, without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Ramona Isabel Ramirez. Ma'am? Thank you, Ms. Danica. Allow me to share my slide. Kita na po yung aking presentation. Yes po, ma'am. Thank you so much. First, I would like to give my warmest greetings of a good and blessed day to everyone. As mentioned, I am from Central Bicol State University of Agriculture, uh, serving as the Vice President for Research and Innovation of the university. I will be sharing with you the CBSUA policy and the of course, along with the presentation of the policy, I may be able to share with you some practices that we had in research ethics. Nagmumo po yung aking presentation. Yes, ma'am. We have to, of course, we know that in an academic community that is mandated to generate knowledge and technologies, that is because we would like to empower and develop communities like our universities, particularly CBSUA, the practice of ethics is highly necessary. Because in a community where majority claims to be researchers and professionals, ethics is needed because it promotes respect towards society and others, especially so that the ones involved are professionals. Indeed, research is a pillar of development. All of us in the academe knows it, as the utilization of research-generated knowledge and technologies can serve as backbone of development. So therefore, protecting the rights of research workers is a must. CBSUA and an SUC level four as the mandate of research and community service. And this gave us good reasons to uphold or promote ethics and research. As there is a common term that we can associate with both ethics and community service, and that is respect. Now, what is research ethics? It is very simple. Basically, it is just being responsible or it is the respectable conduct of research. But then, if we are going to consider the ethical principles, many key terms may be associated. It is associated with integrity, competence, non-maleficence, justice, dignity, responsibility, honesty, confidentiality, and many more. This is involving both the researchers and the participants. Now, what is honesty in research? Honesty is being honest with beneficiaries and respondents. This is also being honest with the findings and methodology. This is also being honest with direct and indirect stakeholders that we are dealing with in the implementation of our research work. Integrity, on the other hand, is very much related to honesty because integrity is ensuring honesty and sincerity. This is also pertaining to fulfilling agreements and promises and must not take the false expectation and promises when we deal with our respondents and other personalities involved in our conduct of research. Objectivity, on the other hand, is avoiding bias in experimental design. 
data analysis, data interpretation, peer review, and all other related aspects. In the informed consent, we have to ensure that the person knowingly and voluntarily gives consent to participate in the conduct of our research. That is also related, this is also related to the autonomous right of the individual to participate. As such, we have to inform the participant of the road, the objectives or benefits, and the possible harm that, may, that they may experience as they participate in the conduct of our research. As to respect, this includes autonomy and protection of persons participating in the research activities. Respect to those capable of deliberation and protection and also to those who are vulnerable against harm or abuse. Beneficence is the ethical obligation to maximize possible benefits and also to minimize possible harm to our respondents. Non-maleficence is the protection of the human subjects such that we do no harm or we minimize the risk. We also have to ensure privacy autonomy, and dignity. Responsible publication is also included because we have to ensure that we are responsibly publishing to promote and uptake research knowledge such that no duplication is allowed. Confidentiality is also associated with research ethics such that Protecting confidential information as those that you have in the proposal or the paper that we come across. The use of research output. There is also confidentiality and to freedom not to answer questions or withdrawal from the research. Also confidentiality on how to contact when the participants need additional information about that particular research under. Further, non-discrimination is also connected with ethics in research because we have to avoid discrimination on the basis of age, sex, race, and other factors that may lead to violation of human rights and are not related to the study. We also need to be open. Openness is to share results, data, and other sources, but also accept encouraging comments and constructive feedbacks. Carefulness and respect to IPR is also another thing that we have to give attention to. We have to be careful about possible errors or bias. And we also have to, at all times, give credit to the IPR of others. We are just allowed to paraphrase, never plagiarize. And justice is also considered in ethics for research and in fact, in all of the undertakings that we have to do. Justice is the obligation to distribute the benefits and burden fairly. We have to treat equals equally, but we also have to give reasons for differential treatment based on a widely accepted criteria. So as we, we can distribute fairly the benefits and the board. So my dear friends, those are basic things that we need to know as regards to the promotion, application, or practice of ethics in the conduct of research. But how do we promote that in CBSUA? How do we go about it? And how do we ensure that in, in as much as possible, there could be ethics in all things that we do related to research? The first thing that we do is we come up with policies. Let me share with you this organizational structure of the Central Biko State University of Agriculture, particularly the Research and Innovation Cluster. 
As you can see, we have technical committees. And this technical committees is under and above the PP for Research and Innovation. There is a council first, which is the University Council for Research and Innovation that is being consulted when we have to implement an initiative relative to the policy formulation. Other than that, technical committees such as the technical working group, technology assessment and management committee, we also have the research ethics board. This is above the different directors on the key divisions of the different key divisions in the cluster because these technical committees are helping the different division directors in deciding uh, two matters related to research, including, among others, the ethical conduct and the ethical procedures. There are functions that are enumerated for this different technical committees. And this is given in chapter two, article two, section 2.4 of our research and innovation operations manual. For Details, may I share with you? Nakikita po yung aking sinishare from the operations manual? Um, Ma'am, you're sharing for the PowerPoint screen? Uh, meron po akong naka-hyperlink na part ng aming operations manual relative to the technical committees uh, where I am sharing the different functions of the technical committees. Hindi po nakikita. Uh, hindi po, ma'am. Um, anyway, I just would like to share with everyone that this technical working group are involved in the evaluation of our research proposals, including the monitoring and evaluation of ongoing and completed researches. The, the function is to evaluate all aspects from the methodology and adherence to the ethics and policies of the university. The research ethics board has a special function to really look into. And this one is headed by the BP for Research and Innovation, co chaired by uh, the director for research. And together with them as the members, as is the director of the intellectual property management office, the Dean of the College of Veteran, Veteranary Medicine for, he, for him or her to be able to give information relative to uh, the use of animal subjects and also the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources Dean because most of our researchers are into agriculture, CBSUA being an agricultural research university. Other than that, may I share with you that included in the function of the Vice President for Research and Innovation, which is found at page eight of the operations manual under letter D, is to ensure, ensure to maintain academic freedom and value more students' interest. And on letter H, ensure to protect the creative works of all faculty and personnel of the university by establishing a patent center or a center that would protect the uh, intellectual property rights of everyone. Another part of our operations manual is the creation of the intellectual property management office which is a manifestation of our, uh, of our, of our dire need to, to actually promote ethics, operations of which is stipulated in chapter four, page nine of the operations manual. The Intellectual Property Management Office 
is tasked to supervise the implementation of IP policy and the commercialization of university IP assets, an intellectual property management office is created. This is headed by a director appointed by the president, and they are tasked to protect and ensure existing rules and regulations, which is related to the right, uh, securing the rights of scientists, inventors, artists, and other gifted CBSUA personnel over their property creations. There are policies that are being implemented by the Intellectual Property Management Office. And this is found in chapter uh, five of our CBSUA Operations Manual. By the way, dear friends, the CBSUA Research and Innovation Operations Manual is a collective, is a consolidated uh, uh, operations manual of the different units of the Research and Innovation Cluster of the University. Chapter two being uh, the chapter that cater into the operation of the research services division, chapter three for the extension services division and others. For all the centers, we are also including one chapter for the operation of the other units, including the laboratories and support offices. So as you can see, I am sharing on the slide, a part of the operation manual of the IPMO, where we have in article three, the scope of policy that covers the IP rights. We also have article four, the intellectual property ownership. In Article 3, the scope of policy, we st it is clearly stipulated in Article 3 uh, that the IP policy applies to all the faculty members, teaching and not teaching staff, including students and non-teaching employees, adjunct faculty, and they are referred to as the academic and research staff. The, the policy on the intellectual property is applicable and should be followed by all of the personnel in the university. We also have in Article 4, Section 1, the IP ownership, and this gives us the guidelines on who and what and how to protect the ownership of a particular intellectual property generated through research by our faculty researchers. Other than that, the deans are also involved because in our operations manual, there is a part that requires the deans of the colleges to also exercise the power to uh, protect, I mean, their responsibility to protect the intellectual property rights of every researcher. This is found in chapter two of article two, section 2.3. And this is on page 27 of the operations manual. Responsibility is stated in letter A, requires the deans and the researchers to ensure or safeguard the ethical conduct of research. The conduct of research consistent with the policies on research operation of the university and with highest ethical and technical standards. Also in chapter two, article three, section 13, page 37 of the RI operations manual, we have this part manifest the university intent to safeguard the rights of all parties involved in research. There is an IRR for it that are included in the appendices. Like for example here, faculty student research partnership and student fellowship. We are protecting the rights, not only of our faculty researchers, but also of the students. There has been some cases in the university where faculty, are actually claiming and requiring, requesting the, the, 
the office of the research director to allow them to also submit for crediting the research that was conducted by the student in their thesis because the faculty is claiming that they are the ones who guide the students and the idea is from there. We do not allow that because technically we recognize that the, the research is under the name of the student, so there is a right over that. And because of these this cases that often arises from the faculty request, then we come up with an IRR and we that uh, that actually cater into the rights of the of the parties wherein we have to follow what is indicated in the IRR when it comes to faculty student research partnership and fellowship a little later i will be sharing with you copies of the IRR so that you would see how we cater into research ethics in certain cases that arises relative to it. As to the ownership of research outputs and facilities, also included in Chapter 2, Article 3, Section 18 of the RI Operations Manual is the ownership of research outputs and facilities. In Section 18.1, it was specified that the ownership of research outputs shall be governed by IPR policy of the university, which is being implemented by the Intellectual Property Management Office, adhering to the different national policies such as 155 and other related policies. In our operations manual, 18.1, 1618.1, it is stated that ownership of research outputs shall be governed by the approved intellectual property right policy of the university. And at the moment, the CBSUA have that policy approved and is being implemented by the director of the intellectual property management office. In chapter four, article three, section three, of the operations manual also, and this is found on page 96, is the policy for acceptance and rejection manifesting ethics and publication. The criteria specifies that ethical standards are complied for studies involving human and animals. Our manuscript was subjected to a plagiarism test and there is also a policy on retraction, which is found on section seven, the use of human subjects on section 10, the conflict with interest in section 11, and publication and ethics malpractice on section 12 of our chapter four, article three of our operations manual. Dear friends, um, I may not be able to show to you the entirety of our operations manual, but I would like to share to everyone that the, the practice of ethics and research are all integrated in the creation of the CBSUA Research and Innovation Cluster Operations Manual. Because in section three, as you can see here, may I read, for, for criteria for acceptance and rejection, a manuscript is accepted when it is endorsed for publication by two or three referees. The instructions of the reviewers are substantially complied. Ethical standards and protocols are complied for studies involving humans and animals. And the manuscript passed the plagiarism test with a score at most 10% or less similarity index and grammarly rating of 95% or Otherwise, the manuscript is returned back to the author. By the way, chapter four caters to the publication office operations manual. There are also our other IRR 
for certain cases as deemed necessary. And these are all included in the appendices of our manual. For Appendix B, we have an IRR for plagiarism, deception, falsification, and publication of research results. For Appendix C, we have an IRR for crediting of personally conducted research that do not follow protocol. Because in the university, their friends, we have uh, a protocol and the submission of proposals, have it approved, ev evaluated and approved for conduct. But there are, cer there are certain cases wherein faculty members were not able to meet the deadline and they continue the conduct of their research undertaking personally without accessing to the fund of the university. In recognition of the efforts, we have to subject them to a certain uh, evaluation and, pol and policy for them to be given that benefit of having it credited as a research out of the faculty. We also have an IRR for student advisorship. And this is one IRR that we came up in response to those concerns and issues arising between the advisor and the student. Because this is, this is because we would like to protect the rights both of the faculty and the students. There is sanction for the offense in Appendix D that manifests adherence to the ethical standards. The requirement for crediting of personally conducted research is given in Appendix C. This supports the practice of research ethics because we will not just allow one faculty member to submit a research without proving uh, to the authenticity of the research output and without having it evaluated for plagiarism, duplication, or falsification. For Appendix E, that is our response to ensure the ownership of the student of their thesis. Because we have observed that there are some, I should not say unscrupulous faculty members, who are submitting these researches of their students and getting its ownership. In the implementation of the research project and also in the evaluation of research-related documents, we also manifest adherence to the ethical standards. Like, for example, in the tools that we use. In the, uh, I am showing here with you a sample of the client survey questionnaire that we, are, that we use in the implementation of one of our externally funded research, we included in there the consent form. This is in response to um, one particular uh, principle of research ethics, and that is uh, an informed consent of the participant in research. I am also showing you here in my presentation a sample of a confidentiality agreement because in the conduct of proposal evaluation, which is being done before the, the research proposals are being, uh, before the research proposals are given uh, notice to proceed, we requested some reviewers and evaluators, experts in the field to evaluate the proposals, but we would like to protect the right of the proponent over the proposal. We asked the re reviewer or the evaluator to sign a confidentiality agreement for. This one, yung nasa gitna, is for the review of the proposal, while this other one, the third uh, picture that I am sharing, is a sample of a confidentiality agreement that we asked our external evaluators to sign uh, when we have or when we conduct the in-house review of uh, completed and of ongoing and completed researches in the university. 
My dear friends, these are some of the policies that I can share with you in response to the uh, practice of uh, ethical of ethics in research in the university. Aside from that, may I also share some best practices that we have in research uh, that would encourage our faculty members, though we have to, to, to adhere to the ethical standards, we would like to ensure that they may not be demotivated to conduct research. So we also give them some benefits like we give credit load to the research and extension projects of the faculty. We allow research collaboration, and we consider their performances in the evaluation and rankings, particularly in the release of the benefits. And we also give them training related to uh, research implementation, publication, and also on ethical standards of research. We give them an enabling environment by providing research-related software. We give them support offices where they can go through if there are some uh, concerns that they have to, to ask. We also have the statistics unit in the, under the CBSUA Research uh, Services Division. And we created two journals for them to be able to have an opportunity for publication. Dear friends, maybe that would be all. Please allow me to share with you that ethics promote respect towards society and others. Upholding ethics in research makes us a reputable research work. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramirez. So from Dr. Ramirez's presentation, we have found um, the key principles of, these, of ethics in research. And um, she has shown that these are all embedded all throughout the research operations manual. And now, uh, we are now midway to our program. So let's now move on to our fourth speaker. Our fourth speaker, Dr. Ruby S. Wazo, holds a bachelor and advanced degrees in philosophy. He is a full professor teaching philosophy in the undergraduate and graduate levels at the University of San Carlos and is also currently serving as the chair of their Department of Philosophy and University of San Carlos Research Ethics Committee. His research expertise includes hermeneutics and phenomenology, Filipino philosophy and value system, political philosophy, ethics, philosophy of the human person, postmodernism, and education. So these are all highly qualitative. So we really have a good mix of speakers this afternoon. So Dr. Suazo is also a member to various professional organizations, including the National Research Council of the Philippines. According to him, adhering to the principles of ethics in research is nothing but an institution's commitment to ensure transparency, equitable treatment, and protection of vulnerable participants. So ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Ruby S. Wazo. Good afternoon, dear colleagues and friends. My name is Ruby S. Wazo. I am the current chair of the University of San Carlos' Research uh, Ethics Committee. It is my pleasure to share with you a brief background of the research ethics policies of USC, the problems encountered implementing them, and what we did to overcome these challenges. The University of San Carlos Research Ethics Committee was established on August 15, 2013 to enhance USC's quality assurance in research involving human participants. Thus, it has been given the task of reviewing and ensuring that all research involving human participants adhere to the highest ethical standards of health and social science research. It also institutionalized the mandated requirement for an ethics review for all research submitted by faculty and students or by an external funding agency guided by sets of SOPs approved by the Philippine Health Research Ethics Board or FREB. To assure the independence of USC REC on carrying out its functions, the University of San Carlos 
recognizes the importance of the multidisciplinary composition of the Research Ethics Committee, that is with the inclusion of scientists, non-scientists, and non-affiliated members who shall follow procedures and decision-making principles that is independent of political, institutional, professional, and market influences. Nevertheless, to warrant a seamless relation with the university's research policies and standards, but without prejudice to its independence in doing ethical review and decision-making, the USCREC is organizationally designated under the university's Research Development Extension and Publications Office. FREB, although it accepted the current location of USC, USC REC at USC's organogram under the RDEPO has a reservation on it due to probable conflict of interest the moment the RDEPO submitted its research for REC review. FREB suggested that it may be placed under the VPAA. Furthermore, the establishment of USC REC was also in compliance with FREB's policy requiring Philippine institutions that engage in biomedical and behavioral research to establish an institutional research ethics committee, which shall provide independent, competent, and timely ethical review of proposed studies whose main purpose is to help safeguard the dignity, rights, safety, and well-being of all actual or potential research participants. Moreover, the University of San Carlos Research Ethics Committee submitted itself for accreditation with FREM, the national policy-making body in health research ethics in the country. As a consequence, USCREC was granted level one accreditation by the Philippine Health Research Ethics Board or FREB on January 6, 2017. And on July 15, 2019, USCREC was granted a one-year provisional level two accreditation until July 14, 2020. But due to, the, the, due to the challenges brought about by the onslaught of the COVID-19 pandemic, USC REC was not able to comply with the requirements of FREB, thus the suspension of its accreditation. Nevertheless, with its fervent commitment to ensure its continued adherence to the universal principles for, protect, for the protection of human participants in research, USC REC submits again for accreditation and has been granted a provisional level two accreditation effective May 18, 2021 until May 17, 2022, with the possibility of being given a full three-year level two accreditation, which USC REC eventually received on September 5, 2022, that will last until September 4, 2025. Let me now share with you some of the challenges that USC REC encountered and the actions we took to manage them. During the level one accreditation application process, we encountered difficulty in ensuring REC membership as only a few had undertaken the basic research ethics training. The training needed for the university's initial step toward the creation of an institutional REC to be accredited by FREB. So USC REC sent prospective members to join basic research ethics training organized by the Central Visayas Consortium for Health Research and Development, which USC hosted on September 27 to 28, 2017. To further increase its breadth trained faculty, USC also requested from FREB a breadth solely for the prospective REC members of USC, which was held on February 20, 2021, uh, 22, 21, 2020. This was participated in by administrators and researchers from the different departments with resource persons coming from FREB. This allowed the committee to open the call and invitations to potential and interested reviewers who are interested to join the committee as it expanded its membership. Again, USC REC intends to have another round of breadth for USC in 2023, subject to the availability of trainers from FREB. We need more trained members as we intend to modify the research ethics review process to resolve the problem encountered as to the timely ethical review of proposed studies. Now, USC REC had enough members to make the system run, but sometimes reaching the quorum of the meeting is a problem. So the alternate member system has been operationalized. An alternate member attends a meeting as a substitute for a regular member whose participation counts toward the quorum requirements. She will serve in the same representative capacity as the member for whom she substitutes. 
aside from being of the same field of discipline or closest to it as the substituted member, she should have undergone BRET prior to becoming an alternate member. Level 1 accreditation also requires compliance with RA 10.173 or the Data Privacy Act of 2012. So a delegation was sent to participate in the Privacy and Data Protection Workshop held on October, October 26 to 27, 2017 at Bayfront Hotel, Cebu City. Subsequent training sessions were already handled by U.S.'s Privacy and Data Protection Officer. Privacy and Data Protection Form Checklist is also included in the table of SOPs. Most often, institutions are slow to accept changes in the system, although the research ethics review requirements have been incorporated already in our university's institutional guidelines for thesis and dissertation, compliance with it was not seamless, which Fred might have noticed due to the turnout of proposals reviewed by the committee. So for our level two accreditation application, Fred asked for proof that a memo has been released in requiring all research involving human participants to undergo ethics review. Thus, the Office of the Vice President for Academic Affairs released a memo on July 5, 2021 to that effect. As of today, we have already reviewed 248 research protocols compared to the average of 80 protocols for the last five years. Another issue encountered was the constraining effect of the pandemic on the face-to-face -face meeting requirement stipulated by the committee's SOP. Thus, an amendment to the SOP on the conduct of meetings was done to include provisions pertaining to the conduct of online meetings and voting to ensure that the, the SOP follows FREB requirements. Moreover, the committee, realizing the need to conform to the requirements provided by FREB, was revised or has revised its, o its SOP following the 2020 FREB SOP workbook and CSA recommendations comments and suggestions after the submission of the July 2021 version of the SOPs were also acted upon and duly incorporated in the current existing version. Ultimately, most of the problems hounding US Rec is on the timely ethical review of proposed studies and on the manner comments and recommendations are being written down. With the surging volume of protocols submitted now as a result of the OVPAA's memo, timely ethical review of proposed studies becomes a perennial problem, especially that members of USREC are recently being promoted to handle other functions in the university. It is really better if volunteers for REC do not hold other university functions, thus the need to have new breeds of REC volunteers to replace them. Moreover, USREC needs to organize its system of review to have all expedited reviews done at the school or department level. We are, however, still at the conceptualization process. We hope to connect with institutions having this model to help us. The ways comments and recommendations are being written down in the protocol review assessment form pose also a challenge to researchers. The practice of not providing complete comments or remarks as provided for in the protocol review assessment form, informed consent checklist, and other forms with assumptions that points referred to it to in the blank parts are in order pose a problem to the researchers on how to comply with them. REC agreed that all comments and recommendations in the assessment forms should be written thoroughly and completely. Recommendations must state clearly the course of action that the researchers must do for easy compliance with. There is also a need for the committee to maximize the time during meetings to discuss not only the protocol, but as to how reviewers gave their reviews and to use these as educative opportunities to improve reviews of future protocols. There are also challenges in the completeness of the submitted protocols, monitoring of reviewed protocols, submission of study completion form, and final report. Thus, USC REC conducts a semestral orientation with the faculty, research advisors, and students, highlighting the need for the submission of a complete research protocol, the study completion form, and final report. The need to efficiently and effectively communicate to the applicants the summary of the, com of the committee's deliberation, especially on the different actions to be done to, to ensure the ethical conduct of the research process is acted upon, has been responded to by the Secretariat's development of a matrix on the summary of actions taken that contains all the important items. Just for the uh, information of everybody, these are the current members of USC REC. With the influx of research protocols to be reviewed, 
we increase the number of its members to 14 from 9, but the current number of members is still not sufficient for the current volume of submitted protocols. Does the plan to re reorganize the expedited review system. For continuous upgrading of the members, training that includes topics on the elements of research ethics based on the national and international ethical guidelines and local regulations, ethics review or protocols using a combination of the didactics and small group discussions are continually done. The chair, the member secretary, and staff secretary also attended training on SOP writing and revision. Members are oriented in direct SOPs whenever amendments are being done. Friends and colleagues, these are the gist of the challenges that USREC encountered. This is also the profile of applicants and clients that we have. So as you can see here from 2017, we have only a few, but now we have 248 as a result of uh, that uh, memo issued by the VPAA. And these are some of the uh, uh, proof now of what we did for the dissemination of US RIC policies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Swaso. So from Dr. Swaso's presentation, we have found out that the Research Ethics Board of the University of San Carlos is already established and has a level two accreditation. But even so, they still encounter problems in implementing them. And one of this is that the members of the Research Ethics Board is not enough for the influx of researchers that they receive for review. Like what have Dr. Swazo presented earlier for 2022, they have received 248 entries for review. So thank you, Dr. Swazo. And now let's move on to our fifth and final speaker. So our fifth and last speaker is representing a newly minted SUC, the Northern Bukidnon State College. So Dr. Jovelin G. De Losa is currently an associate professor at NBSC and their current vice president for academic affairs. As a full-time faculty member, she teaches both undergraduate and graduate degree programs and handles programs such as educational management and instructional design. Dr. Delosa has also produced several publications and has garnered several awards throughout her career. From our speaker, Dr. Delosa, for a more reliable and meaningful research practice, start right, begin with respect, and begin with ethics. So ladies and gentlemen, finally, let us welcome Dr. Jovelin G. Delosa. Good afternoon. To the Dean of uh, the college, good afternoon, Dean, and to all the officials of UPLB and all the panelists here and the participants of this webinar, Maayong Hapon. I am Jovelin Delosa from Northern Bukidnon State College, Manolo Fortich, Bukidnon. So I would like to start my sharing this afternoon with the code we were asked, we were requested to give our quotes about ethics. And I would like to emphasize that for a more reliable and meaningful research practice, we will start right. And by being right, we recognize the importance of respect. And that is to recognize the role of ethics in our institution. So for the context, we are a newly converted state college from a community college. So it's our second year. We were converted last October 2020. We serve the communities of uh, Manolo for Teach, Bukidnon. And our challenge is that as we transition to the being a state college, we are also at the same time implementing the mandates of the commission, mandates on instruction, research, extension, production. And we also added an important domain, which is values formation for our faculty and our students. So this is our vision. We are a we want to be, we envision ourselves to be a college of choice, nationally recognized for having innovative and sustainable programs in the academic uh, academic aspect in research extension and services. And we want to produce students who are 
uh, professionals who will cultivate both values and skills. And we have the mission that as an accessible community-based institution, we want to provide educational opportunities and develop students to be competent and responsible and to be of service to the community. We, because we are, we, we are still beginning, we are small, we have three programs. We have the Bachelor of Science in Information Technology, Teacher Education Program, Business Administration. And we have also our Department for General Education Curriculum, which is a strong support for all our three programs. So as a new state college, we embrace the 2F3C model. So this is our pedagogical and eutagogical at the same time relational model of teaching and learning and as how we relate with our governance in the college. So I would like to present my sharing following the uh, 2F3C framework. So this is represented by two Fs. We value the five adjectives to be focused, flexible, committed, connected, and consistent. And because we are starting, we want to we start small, but we want to start right. That is why after the state college conversion, the ethics board was formed immediately. And the institution subjected itself to the Philippine Health Research Ethics Board basic research ethics training last April 25-26 and we are in the phase of finalizing and crafting and finalizing the contents of our research ethics manual. So this is our simple logo that shows the interplay of the role of the researchers, the participants in research, and the unbiased decision from the research committee, and also the important role of the research ethics committee in our college. So we look into the policies as uh, the main content of the manual, and uh, it includes also the members which are appointed by the research development office, upon the concurrent of the president, upon the approval of the president. And we try our best that these members have the qualifications and experience to review the research work. So in the research manual, we look into these important parts like composition and structure. The previous experts, the previous speakers have comprehensively shared to you all their policies and uh, those we, as I was listening also now, I'm learning a lot as we are also uh, building our own. So this manual includes procedures of review for full expedited and exempted work, guidelines on initial submission, resubmission, and post-approval submissions, meeting procedures, the documentation and archiving, the conduct of site visits, and how do we manage complaints and appeals or questions, and how to write and revise SOPs, and the different forms that we need to give to the researchers, to our faculty, and to our students. So we also look into these important elements like we focus on how to explain, how to make uh, this, the research, how we convince our participants of the benefits of research in terms of the intellectual property, product development, people services, partnerships, policy and publications, and also the uh, minimization of the risks, like we are preparing clear, uh, formats for our informed consents and how we can give clear information to the participants of how their data will be used and reported. So under flexibility, we have identified some modes and mechanisms like timelines. We are looking forward 
to be accredited and recognized by FREV. And our past training, that was a an online training and we want to do another cycle of training and that would be a face-to-face -face training. And then we also look into two levels, the works of the faculty for our institutional projects and the works of our students because it's part and embedded in their curriculum that they'll produce uh, student research. Now for committed, we commit to work hard so that we can subject ourselves for the FREB accreditation following we want to achieve functionality of our structure and position adherence to the policies we are in the face of really understanding and studying international national and even our own policies and the clarity of standard operating procedures and its consistency the completeness of the review process, adequacy of the administrative support, the efficiency and the accuracy of how we document and archive our processes and systems. So the ethics committee is reviewing and completing the different SOPs and trying to really identify the institutional organogram. What is the role of REC or the Research Ethics Committee in relations to the other units of the institution? Now for the challenges being a new college and wanting to really start right in terms of observing research ethics protocols. We want to strengthen the functionality of our structure and composition. And that is also one of our uh, challenges. And also or in orienting the departments, our students, our faculty on the role of ethics that beyond a requirement, it is important. It may be, it may ask and demand some rigor from their part, from our part, but we want them to understand its, its value and the consistency and clarity of our em implementation because that's really the challenge uh, being new, how, how things are, how vocabularies are interpreted, how our processes are being communicated and the availability of the members because we are few. Our faculty are committed. However, many of our regular faculty are also being designated to various assignments in the college and also challenge on understanding specific guidelines, crafting guidelines on inviting external members to be part of, uh, of the team or the committee and studying policies, how we address research conducted outside our school, our college, because as of now, we are receiving letters asking permissions that they will conduct research in the school and some invitations also. So uh, that is one of our of the areas that we need to look into and expanding our expertise. So many of us are new in the college. So while we are building our pedagogical competence, instructional uh, competence, we are also doing all these things. And we need to be always aware of the protocols when studies are conducted with IP communities. We are serving uh, many of our students belong to the IP uh, tribes in Bukidnon, and we have potential research components and directions that would really help our IP communities. We need to study how to do that. And on institutional monitoring, on the level of the researcher the and the department, uh, all of these are laid on our table at the same time. So the manual at the same time, uh, the implementation. Now for connected, we want to have these actions and we have these actions. We are just blessed to have a supportive uh, leadership, the supportive president and very hands on also on how we start uh, being a researcher herself. So uh, she is guiding all of us in terms of uh, these processes. And some of the members of the institution are 
reviewers of uh, ethic review ethics reviewers before in their previous institutions so that is also uh a good support and the involvement of faculty in research projects and the training and uh, mentoring. So we need, we look into these areas. Now we are in the finalization of our SOP formats, having dialogues and meetings with the departments and more training to capacitate our researchers. So she is uh, Dr. Hinita, our research ethics coordinator. So I would like again to end my sharing with what I have mentioned uh, a while ago that we want to start right. And that's why we took courage also to, to accept the invitation. Being new, we accept the, this opportunity given to us to learn and to share. And um, my gratefulness to our college president, Dr. Almaden, and to Mom Serenias, our research and extension director. And at NBSC, we create futures, transform lives guided by God. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. DeLosa. And now that we are done with all the presentations, I think we could all see similarities among the research ethics policies of the universities that we have invited, that there is just a varying degree of implementation. Like for NBSC, which is a newly established college, is just starting to implement or create specific guidelines for their research ethics review. And there's also the problem of availability of members and so on. We already have a few questions here, but before I proceed, let me first call um, our discussant to weigh in on the presentations, Dr. Evely P. Serrano of the Institute of Governance and Rural Development of the College of Public Affairs and Development. Dr. Evely. Thank you very much, Danica. All right. Um, yeah, first of all, yeah, let me uh, thank our resource uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Manuel, Dr. De Los Santos, Dr. Ramirez, Dr. Suazo, and Dr. De Loza, De Loza for sharing with us how their institutions implement their research ethics policies, the challenges and issues in the implementation, and more importantly, there are ways to overcome these challenges and issues. As we know, there has been a rising recognition of the importance of ethics in the conduct of research. It's good to note that higher education institutions, or HEIs, are exerting effort to institutionalize research ethics, establishing research ethics committees and institutional review boards, requiring uh, faculty, researchers, and students to have their research proposals undergo ethics review, and facilitating research ethics training, not just among faculty and staff, but also among students, all in an attempt to, hold, to uphold ethics in research. However, as noted by Lasco et al. in 2021, research ethics committees or institutional review boards, or IRBs, have also been criticized for being barriers to research. Some of our graduate students at UPLB, for example, are expressing their concerns regarding the research ethics review, which is now being required by university, by the university that is. So we recognize, however, that the need, uh, the need for ethics review and with proper guidance, I believe that there would be fewer um, complaints co Complaints, quote unquote, as such move of the university is also for the benefit of our students. As mentioned by Dr. De Los Santos earlier, the lack of ethics review can result to research articles being rejected by reputable journals. Now, all in all, today's uh, presentations highlight the issues, challenges, and ways forward in implementing research ethics review. Yes, there's no denying that we need ethics in research. The question now is, how do we overcome the issue of inequity, which is being associated to ethics review? While big universities and colleges, such as those of our resource speakers today, have established mechanisms to ensure the smooth conduct of research ethics review, there are institutions that don't have their own accredited research ethics board. 
Lasco et al. in 2021 reported that the research landscape invariably favors those with the research resources to do research. And researchers tend to attract funding. Consequently, how will we be able to really uphold research ethics when not everyone has easy access to research ethics review? Resolving the issue of inequity in ethics review requires major reforms and interventions that should be done collectively. As some HEIs complain of the lack of resources to establish their own institutional review boards, I agree with Pagkatipunan et al. who suggests the need to explore different regional policies and practices on the creation of research committees and examine the logistics in their maintenance. Universities can also look into working together, perhaps consider establishing a network that will continue the sharing that we started today. Moreover, research ethics must be incorporated into the curriculum. The value of research ethics must be ingrained in the minds as well as in the hearts of our students so that they will be able to observe um, consistently research ethics principles in their research work. Accordingly, we should see research ethics not only as a requirement, but as mentioned by the World Health Organization, as a way to protect the dignity, rights, and welfare of research participants. It must be remembered that the observance of research ethics signifies our credibility as researchers. Hence, Everyone in the university, faculty, researchers, students must receive the necessary training on research ethics. Indeed, academic institutions should be at the forefront in ensuring that research ethics is given importance. I therefore commend Visaya State University, Central Bicol State University of Agriculture, the University of San Carlos, Northern Bukidnon State College, and of course, our very own UPLB for their efforts to uphold research ethics and overcome the issues and challenges in the implementation of research ethics policies. While the challenges and issues remain, what is important is that our universities have identified ways forward that would enable us to move past the birth pains of establishing institutional review boards and implement more strictly and competently research ethics policies. So thank you very much, Danica. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Serrano. So now we will be accommodating questions from our participants. So may I invite our research speakers and our discussant to please open our cameras for the open forum. And let me start the questioning. So um, to ensure that questions are relevant to the scope of the presentations, um, there are some members of our team behind the scenes collating and moderating the questions. So the question number one here given for here at Zoom is that I, I think this could be answered by all of our research speakers. Can the research ethics board provide good research practice, good laboratory practice, and good clinical practice certification, which are asked in some institutional review boards? Who would like to answer uh, the question first? Should I call on po <laughs> any of our research speakers? Um, yes. Ah, yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, as per policy, I am speaking for the Central Bicol State University of Agriculture because the creation of that uh, uh, committee, special committee that caters in the research ethics of the university. Um, this, are, this is being approved by the uh, by the Board of Regents. So giving this uh, body a legal personality to issue certification relative to that. So I think this uh, ethics board or the special committee that we have in the university can legally issue certification. Okay, how about uh, for the case of UPLB, Dr. Manuel, I've seen you raising your hand for earlier. Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Danica. Uh, regarding the question, um, 
the board, the UPLB Research Ethics Board, also envisions giving trainings, uh, ethics trainings in the future that will qualify um, the students or maybe um, the faculty and staff to earn this ethics certificate that they can submit as a requirement. It's, it is one of the documentary requirements listed in the uh, UPLB Red website. Um, currently, however, our efforts are focused on um, uh, being, um, uh, our efforts are focused on the first batches of protocols that we are receiving for review. So um, once we are able to um, gain the confidence, uh, because we're still learning in this uh, review of the proposals coming uh, initially from the students, uh, we, we plan to uh, hold trainings as well. Uh, it's also mentioned in the lecture earlier that uh, that is one of our targets to um, to be able to hold trainings, webinars for info dissemination and later on for the issuance of certificates in ethics as well. Thank you. Okay. How about po for the case of um, BSU, Ma'am Dr. Janet? Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Actually, we share the same uh, experience with that of Dr. Manuel. Since we are a new um, formed committee, uh, we are still at the stage of trying to, you know, uh, hasten our um, policies and introducing introducing this to the different departments. But in the long run, we are also looking at this direction to issue certifications to um, to trainings to our students and faculty faculty who will be. Um, joining perhaps yung basic muna, yung basic research ethics, okay. then later na po yung mga advanced like the GCP kasi mas advanced na siya. So, yun, that's the direction of our committee po. Thank you. Okay po. And I, I think uh, Dr. Suazo is also raising his hand earlier. So, would like to hear po from a, a, an established research ethics board, uh, um, Dr. Yeah. Suazo. Yeah, yes, good afternoon, po. Danica. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, po. Okay. Sir. So, uh, as far as the requirement now for these certifications needed by Institutional Ethics Board, as far as I know, only FRED now actually uh, conducts or has a, is allowed to uh, conduct these, uh, certi uh, these uh, trainings now for certification, most especially if uh, it is needed by um, Institutional or uh, Hazard. Institutional Ethics Review Board you know, for accreditation. Now, we really actually uh, wanted to uh, have somebody be trained by Fred and then conduct our own uh, training for our uh, members in the university. But as far as I know, it is still uh, Fred now that really okay. has to conduct this uh, training. That we have to request Fred now for uh, training. Okay, sir. Well noted, Paul, for the person who asked. And there's a couple of questions here, Paul, regarding the, re the, the ethics review policies, Paul, for students. No, I think this is for undergraduate and graduate students. So let me ask for the questions since we have a couple of questions here. The first is, how about for the review fees for undergraduate researches for the uh, review ethics board of our universities? Do you charge or... Does the students have to pay? Um, okay, sorry. Sorry, ma'am. Go ahead. I sorry, sorry, po, Dr. Suazo. Um, in the case of VSU, uh, what we have in our guidelines is we will have the uh, a review fee for students for free. Uh, yung may mga bayad lang po are the uh exter are the funded researchers mm, researches funded po, okay. yes po and then um even institutionally funded research uh we are charging that pero very minimal amount lang um that's to support our operations in the committee okay po ma'am uh, dr suazo uh, yes uh, at the uh, university of san carlos we actually uh, charge mm -hmm. the review fee for our undergraduate, uh, graduate, as well as uh, external researchers. Uh, this is actually to uh, support the operation of uh, uh, how is it, the uh, committee. Now, it's actually a bit, uh, it's 
around 1,000 pesos for undergraduate and 1,500, I think, for the graduate. But we are actually uh, trying to look for some other uh, means now to really reduce this uh, research ethics uh, fees now for, for our students. We wish that our internal clients will be uh, free of charge and we simply actually uh, charge our external clients. That's the dream. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the plan. That's the dream of what? Yes, Dr. Manuel? Um, for the UPLB experience, uh, since it is under the UP system, um, fees to be collected from students or maybe for services uh, from um, for services rendered, for example, um, this have to be approved by the BOR or the Board of Regents. And so what we initially did was to do benchmarking by referring to the fees being collected by UP Manila Research Ethics Board. So currently, we have not yet, um, this is not yet approved, but we have prepared a draft. So no fees are currently collected from the graduate, uh, from the review of the graduate student proposals. Now, since the question is about the review of undergraduate um, thesis proposals, um, based on the UPLB Rev uh, SOP, uh, what we are encouraging is that um, for undergraduate um, studies, um, these are normally under the guidance of the advisor. So uh, we are encouraging instead that it should be the advisors who will apply for the uh, ethics approval. And if the research is funded, then uh, a certain fee will be collected based on our proposal. But currently, uh, as I have mentioned, that has not yet garnered the approval of the BOR. So, uh, yeah, so for undergraduate, uh, so far, wala. But we, in the future, what we plan to do is instead to capacitate um, colleges if uh, they have their, uh, for them to have their uh, own uh, ethics committees that will take care of undergraduate research proposals. Thank so, you. so far, are you saying, ma'am, so far, wala pa po tayong nakukuhang request for reviews for undergraduate proposals, tama po, right? For wala, pa po. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. wala pa po. Uh wala -oh. pa. Uh -oh. How about po for the case of CBSUA po and NBSC, do you, um, ano po, nakakalik po tayo ng fees? when it comes po to reviewing reviews undergraduate and graduate researches? Ms. Danica? Uh, yes, po, For the case of CBS2A, we do not collect any amount from our students when it comes to review of proposals and also looking into whether the, the, the methodology or any inputs or any entry in the proposal is ethical or not. But uh, our faculty experts are part of the TWG and part of the panel who reviews the proposals, does not actually charge. They are giving okay. that uh, expertise free for our students. And though some are suggesting we should also consider a policy we can also collect from our students, but have it first approved by the people. At the moment, we can, even both for the graduate school and the undergraduate students. How, how about, ma'am, for the externally funded or institutionally funded researchers? For institutionally funded uh, research, we also do not uh, charge them because after all, the, the, the money that they are using in the implementation of the research is also Came from the, coming from the universities. Okay, po, ma'am. How about for the case of the Northern Bukidnam State College, Dr. Delosa, do you um, plan to collect fees for research ethics reviews of undergraduate and graduate researchers uh, at the moment ma'am since we are still uh we are still in the process of accred uh going for accreditation our research ethics committee uh, board has not yet reviewed student works but mm -hmm. in the context of the student works with their research uh, subjects no collection no with collection. regards to uh, the review of the ethics part of the work. But their, their teachers help them uh, ensure that it is following the protocols of ethics. But in okay. terms of fees, no, ma'am. Yes, okay. ma'am. 
Okay po. And this is also a recurring question among po the questions that among the questions that we have received. This is also still connected with the review process for students po, no? Since sabanggit nga po ni Doc Evely kanina na, na some researchers deem the research ethics review as pampatagal po ng process of a research. And um uh, according to this question, is there a waiting period or is the waiting period can be shortened especially for students or even for those who have limited time to conduct their studies. This is also a concern of us, moms and sirs, in conducting po these searches. This, can this be shortened? Because all of us assume that the, the review process for research ethics is a long process. Po. So this, um, this should be taken into consideration in making our work plans and so on. Ayan po. Sino pong gusto muna sumagot? <laughs> Doc Janet, I can see you smile. So can you answer po first? Um, in sa actually hindi pa kami nag-uumpisa ng sa sa board mismo ano, but um siguro muna namin na meron kaming guidelines para guide din yung students and then aware sila for how long it will take so that they can prepare in advance pa, para na meet namin yung expectation. Um uh, as a committee, we come from different departments. So, uh, uh, having a meeting to for to to meet and discuss about this proposal will really take some time. So, dapat uh, by schedule siya. Although uh, during the initial assessment, the uh, the the chair and the secretariat can already make initial assessment whether it will be needing the type of review that it will need if if it is a full board review, if it is an expedited or a uh, exempt. So from there, uh, siguro mas mapapaiksi siya if uh, makuha na kung anong klase siyang review. So yun na lang siguro yung mas makakapagpadali ng process for for our students. Opo, yes ma'am. How about po for the case of UPLB, Doc Manuel? Okay, um, uh, we recognize the uh, need of the students to have their proposals once submitted to an ethics review committee we know that they are really waiting for the time for the review to, to be finished. Uh, with the UPLB rev, uh, what I can say is that we are doing what we can uh, as humanly possible uh, because all the members of the committees are not fully um, just doing the ethics work. We are faculty members uh, with teaching loads we are we we include our research personnel who who may uh, even handle um, very uh, what's uh, they they also have their share of workload you now for the research uh, uh, personnel faculty uh, so in uh, with the UPLB rev we currently have three panels so for example if we received uh, six protocols in September. Uh, two protocols were distributed to the panels. But uh, once we started the review and we see that there are lacking documents, we return um, the protocols to the principal investigator. And so the countdown will start, uh, will stop once we return um, the document for completion. Okay. And then when it goes back to the REM, uh, then the countdown again begins because we are aware of the turnaround time and we really do want to help the students. And so for this for the for the coming year 2023, if it will be approved, we also plan to increase the number of panels because currently we are just starting with graduate student protocols. And for the two months, we already have received 16 protocols. And for each panel, we only have around five or six members. And sometimes we need, um, uh, mo most of the time, we need a lay member. Um, maybe uh, what I can also inform uh, our fellow uh, research ethics committees in the different universities, that is one of the challenges that we face that I did not mention earlier due to lack of time. It was not mentioned in the recorded video. That we really need to have a pool of lay and non-affiliate members, alternate lay and non-affiliate members, because if there is only one allocated to the panel, which should be all right, when that lay person is not available, then even if all the other regular members are present, the full board meeting could not proceed. 
And so, because we have a limitation of lay members, because we are just starting yet, our plan is to recruit more lay and non-affiliate members that could serve as outer need. So that when a full board meeting is set for a protocol that has more than minimal risk, then it could go as a schedule. We experienced before that a full board me meeting was um, was uh, called off twice just because the lay member could not could not be uh, could not attend. And to follow uh, the guidelines in FREB and the national ethical guidelines. We really need to have a lay member, a non-affiliate member, and at least three regular members in a full board meeting. But if it is for expedited review, then uh, it should proceed faster. But as I said, since we are starting yet with the two batches of uh, protocols, uh, even if it's for expedited review, we, we also include additional members to help us review. So it's not only one um, primary reviewer, but at least two, so that uh, we can have a, um, there would be a more collective um, review for that particular protocol. Because what one name is, the other might be able to know of. Uh, that's for the question. And then uh, I would like to make a comment, um, Ms. Danica, remember, uh, regarding the, the, what was mentioned earlier, that ethics board add a layer of uh, uh, barrier or maybe they cause delay in the evaluation of protocols involving human subjects. Um, this goes a long way when you refer to the history of injustices done to research participants in the past. That is why uh, the eth an, an, ethical, um, an ethical body you know, was suggested, you know, uh, referring to the Helsinki Declaration and the other bodies who emphasize the presence of an ethical review committee or um, yeah, an ethics review committee. We're trying to avoid uh, these injustices that may be done to those vulnerable people who could not speak for themselves. So whether it's just a survey, uh, they say it's just a survey, ma'am or sir, but then we have to look at the questions because sometimes the questions may cause trauma to the participant. Uh, sometimes the researcher may just be focused in getting the data. Uh, I'm not saying this, that it's true for all. I know we are all doing research the best way we can, but just to avoid uh, those pitfalls, then the ethics review committee is there to help. And what may initially be difficult for the principal investigator, because he or she has to pass through uh, what seems like a needle because of the many questions or requirements that are asked at the start. Once he or she gets the certificate of approval, then uh, it's like when he or she graduates and plans to publish that study, he or she already had an initial review, which um, if only if it was not done earlier and flaws were discovered only when the research was done, there's a danger also that that study could not be published or that at the end of the study, one may realize that an injustice has been done. So um, maybe it's hard at the start, but it saves you, it saves the researcher um, from troubles that may be encountered if um, compared to when a research ethics review is not present or uh, yes. is not. Uh, so that's my, uh, that's our insight from for, from me as well as from, I think from my colleagues in the board. Uh, yes, ma'am. I think, I think for the researchers who think that way, our, their mindset should be uh, changed and that incul inculcate into their mindset the, the importance of research ethics or in their researches and not just do research and not minding their participants and just getting the sort of data that they need um, in any way possible. And how about for Dr. Swaso? I know that USC has been receiving yeah. a lot of reviews. Sir, what do you do? Po? How do you handle them? Because I saw on the table uh, yeah. yung is a lot Yeah, actually, well, I was surprised when uh, uh, Dr. Manuel said that uh, they receive uh, 16 uh, protocols uh, here at USC, 
uh, this school year as of today, we already received uh, more than 200 protocols, and there are only uh, nine now uh, actually uh, members and actually the uh, uh, 14 and uh, we uh, of the uh, 14 so excluding myself uh, that would mean actually because the 14 members uh, are divided into two groups now so the ones that will actually uh, look into the scientific validity of the uh, work and the other one the work of the non lay or the lay member now is to actually the uh, sole work of the lay member is to uh, evaluate now the uh, uh, informed consent form. So in other words, then each of the protocol now has actually uh, two reviewers, one an expert, the scientist, and the other one, the lay. So basically, uh, we may have uh, more than 200 uh, uh, hazards, more than 200 uh, protocols submitted, but if, if we are going to scrutinize those uh, protocols closely, most of them, could actually be exempted from review, okay? Because those papers, so those researches, do not involve more than minimal risk and do not also involve uh, vulnerable participants, okay? So it is actually uh, clear in the guidelines that if a work does not involve more than minimal risk nor involve vulnerable participants, they could either be expedited or exempted from review. Okay, so I, I would say uh, they could have been exempted from review. The problem only is that uh, because REC, for example, USC REC, as far as Fred is concerned, now can only accept protocols that are being approved now by the panel. That was if it is a thesis or a dissertation. So before it can be submitted to FREB or to a REC, uh, the panel, now the uh, scientific committee must have approved already now the protocol that is why there are some complaints now about the uh, about the uh how is it about the expertise of the uh, rec to actually go over again now those approved proposals now by the scientific committee now but uh Fred in our actually in our uh, in our application for accreditation has said that even if it has been approved already by the scientific committee, it has to be scrutinized again. Now the scientific validity, et cetera, of the, of the uh, protocol. That is why uh, the one assigned now to review the, uh, the proposal now must also be an expert now of the discipline. Now, if it is a work from social sciences, then the one to review now from the member of Brick who will review that is also a social scientist. Now, if it's for psychology, then must also be a psychologist. No? So, so the problem there, if it is a full review, because full review means it has to be tackled by the full board no? during the regular meeting. And regular meetings are only conducted once a month. Okay? So the uh, earliest possible, if it is for full review, then it will really, the, the researcher has to really wait for at least 30 days, okay? Once a month man lang ang, 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 ang full review, no? But if it is expedited, well, it depends upon how actually uh, good the uh, paper is, then as early as one week, no? Or even then, so uh, two days from the staff, two days, from, one week, no? So one week, it can already be released. That is why, the uh, problem of the uh, how's it? I would say here, the uh, I would say the first gatekeeper here is the research advisor. Now, in other words, the research advisor should already see to it you now that the uh, research proposal is really good to go. Now, so that is really the point. But sometimes, if a research advisor has many advices then the research advisor cannot really uh, guarantee the quality of the submitted protocol. And so that goes to the hands then of the research ethics committee. Because the advisor said, okay, for the graduate, for the research committee, okay, the research committee is the research committee. So that's what we have now in the research ethics committee. And then there are only a few of us. Kaya matatagalan siya kasi i-scrutinize naman siya ng Research Ethics Committee one by one. 
Kaya nga, ang sabi namin, kaya nga, we always have this kind of semestral orientation with research advisors reminding them all the time no, to be meticulous, to be rigorous no, in their checking of the research of the students. No? Para na, hindi kasalanan ng Research Ethics Committee kung bakit natagalan no, ang kanilang, ano, ang kanilang uh, review. And then, when we do the review, and then marami siyang mga, kumbaga, mga errors, so ibabalik yan doon sa researcher, and then ibalik ulit yan ng researcher sa Research Ethics Committee. Kaya magpingpong yan. So pag hindi naman meticulous at saka rigorous yung researcher, then talagang matatagalan siya. So, so ano lang yan, uh, kumbaga, right from the very start, do it right. Now, yun lang talaga ang pinaka, ano ngayon, yun talaga ang pinaka uh, tawag niyan advice kuno no right from the very start na do it right para na hindi na siya magbalik-balik pa pabalik okay. balik Opo, so, thank you very sir, much Opo, in connection po that dun po sa mga na disapprove po na research protocols yung mga pabalik-balik um and for all the other universities po invited since you started reviewing protocols for those who have been disapproved ano po sir yung mga basis Ma'am Sensor, ano po yung mga naging basis for the disapproval of this uh, research protocols po? Abadari lang, nagdari ka lang uh, para mano na. So halimbawa yung sa scientific validity. No? So sa methodology talaga. No, kasi uh, minsan uh, yung methodology uh, hindi siya uh, kumbaga hindi siya tukma doon sa tugma doon sa kanyang, uh, kanyang research problem. Ngayon sabi ko nga, para bang pinalusot na lang siya ng advisor para bang ganun ba na para graduate na sana naman na hindi hindi dapat gawin yun ng advisor na kasi pag mangyayari yun talagang mas lalo siyang matatagalan so yung methodology at saka yung uh, yung question hindi sa nagtugma nagtugma and then yung ano yung uh, yung research instrument no yung research instrument kasi uh, dapat din yung yung research instrument na we have to uh, uh be a uh, there kung ano ba yon na uh, anong tawag yon dapat ba or needed ba to ask permission from the developer no most especially if the instrument is used no it is already for commercial use and then uh use also as a verbatim so yung mga ganun, if it is uh self made no if it is self made then it has to go through uh pilot test or pre test no so maganon and then kadalasan they skip that part na no, they skip that part yung pre test at saka yung pilot test na no, so kaya ibabalik yan ng research ethics committee na no, so kadalasan yun ang ano yung sa ICF ang sa ICF na problema lang hindi lang nila para bang hindi lang nila pina-follow regularly yung template no kasi pag pag may risk siya and then hindi mo binanggit yung risk or dapat sabihin mo na, okay, wala siya na risk. But you have to actually mention that there are no risks. And like that. Para bang disclaimer no, on that part. So to protect the uh, respondent plus to protect the researcher. Yun kasi yung uh, role o yung uh, uh, function din ng ICF. Yes. Thank you very much. How, how about po for the other universe like BSU, ma'am? Have you ever experienced disapproving for research protocols? Same with po with CBSU and NBSC? Uh, yes, sa uh, university po namin, uh, since we have not yet fully really implemented the uh, uh, our our board, but in our college we have the so called as a lo- local ano lang namin review committee. Uh, okay. One of the main reason na na decline or na disapprove yes, yes correct. Um, hindi sakto yung methodology problems in terms of yung objectives na hindi na meet sa question uh, sa questionnaire nila. So basically, it's the same. Uh, but in um, in our university, you no, know, we have this uh, technical working group. So uh, faculty researchers needs to go through this technical working group to really have uh, to review, you no, know, the technicalities and scientific uh, validity of this uh, research before it passes through the ethics review committee. So dapat fulfilled mo na sila doon sa technical review committee, a technical review group, or TWG. Uh, before it is endorsed to us for the ethics clearance. So yun po yung process na sinusunod namin for the ERC. Okay po. Uh, Dr. Ramirez? 
Would you like po to add? Yes, good afternoon po. Um, for the case of CBSUA, for the undergrad and the graduate students, uh, they have their graduate advisory committee and uh, this is advisory committee for the, for the undergraduate who were first uh, tasked to evaluate to evaluate the proposal and look at some ethics related concerns, particularly in the protocol that they are going to implement. Now, should there be a case, this is to facilitate the, the process. Should there be any particular case that needs the intervention and the expertise of the ethics review committee, this is forwarded to the ethics review, uh, to the research ethics board, for, for processing and for the issuance of the certification. Because as we can see, there are many students who are conducting tests and not all of these are actually having ethics-related issues. So yung mga wala, okay na para mapacilitate, naka-empower na po yun doon sa, these are already empowered on the graduate advisory the Tesis Advisory Committee and the Graduate Advisory Committee, which are actually a selected uh, faculty members and faculty researchers with expertise related to the field. But for, for those that are externally funded research, uh, institutionally funded researchers of the faculty, these are all evaluated by the technical working group, which is a special committee also tasked to evaluate the 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 proposals and any research related uh, undertakings of the faculty and should there be any ethics related issues and concerns that is to be addressed and verified this is the time that the ethics review board are coming into the picture because we are evaluating so many proposals so many research studies so we empower them to the committee and the to, to the to the technical working group are carefully selected with the expertise that are necessary. As to the case of those that are very sensitive uh, researchers like that those that concerns the IP, because there is a special policy that we have to look into as far as ethics is concerned and the protection of the indigenous peoples. Uh, the CBSUA has created the IP Center which is uh, uh, which is coordinating with the the NCIP relative to the concerns of the research the, to to the IP related researches. Okay. Thank you. How about po, Dr. Delosa for the case of your university? Um, especially po that Northern Bukidnon State College is in Bukidnon with lots of IP community. So I think po students po from NBSC. Um, the researchers might involve IP communities. Um, do you have any experience po in disapproving research protocols po? Hello, ma'am. Okay po, nawala po ata si Dr. Delosa. But uh, let, me for, let me ask po uh, another question po here. Um, balikan lang po natin yung about sa students po uh, a while ago. Ano po? Um, there's a question po here from our dean. Uh, may we know from the various ethical boards of the different universities how long the training is for students before they can get the certificate and their applications to be approved? To be approved, how long daw po yung process? Gano daw po katagal? Siguro po at, at a time frame? Yes, Dr. Manuel? Um, uh, good afternoon, Dean. Uh, Ma'am, ang tanong niyo po ba ay yung gaano kahaba yung uh, usual na basic research ethics training, Ma'am? Yes, po. Um, ma'am. Ma'am, ang experience po namin, kami po usually nag attend sa UP Manila o kaya po sa De La Salle Health Sciences Center. Usually, two days po yung basic research ethics training. But uh, we know the need of the students now. Kaya po, pag nagtanong sila sa UPLB Rev, meron po kaming favorite <laughs> na nire-recommend na online training na free. And I believe Dr. Mo Lianco, has posted it in the chat. Yun pong mga nirecommend namin. Dr. Lianco is here, here with me. He's Ako, my co-educator. Uh, gaano po kaya kahaba yung, ano, yung ating online training po? 
sa iba pong ano universities uh, ano haba Opo. Uh, kung actually ma'am, yung ni-recommend namin na yun dahil nga po nakaka-attend na kami, hindi ko po yun na-check pa. Pero parang ang dinig ko po na sa four, baka within a day ma'am, matatapos yung training na yun. So I've heard some of our proponents, uh, principal investigators, na naka-attend po nun. Parang within a day na-comply naman po nila and they were issued a certificate that they could submit to them. Yun po. Sa certificate lang naman po yung isasubmit nila sa sa Uh, ethics Review Committee, ma'am. Ah, salamat po, ma'am. Okay. Sa iba po kaya, ganun po ba yun? Yes po, Dr. So- Ay, Dr. Suazo. Yes po. Uh, yung training, no, the one actually we attended are only uh, the ones given by FREB na kasi sila lang yung nagbibigay ng training now for accreditation. So it's only actually uh, two, two days. No? Uh, Kadasan, it's only two days now. And then you'll be given the uh, certificate na for breath. And then iba naman yung training for good clinical practice. So actually, there are several uh, uh, trainings, but yung basic lang is only uh, for two days. Okay, for two days. Is it the same po with the case po of VSU and uh, for students daw po? Um... Uh, as soon as at USC, we do the orientation. It's actually a one-day orientation. Uh, and then uh, we also, uh, para bang sa tawag niyan, para bang online. So we have also this kind of an online online uh, orientation now that the students can uh, go to no, pag kailangan nila ng refresher. Ganun lang po. Okay po. Doc Janet, would you like po to add? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, it's a VSU po. We don't have the system in place yet. But we are thinking of, you know, having this uh, refresher courses for our students or really the, the their orientation kasi hindi lahat ng mga uh, uh, programs dito are oriented to the ethical practices of doing research. And uh, yes, we, we are going to that trajectory. But in the case of our nursing students, uh, we are working closely with our consortium. Um, it's the Eastern Visayas Health Research and Development Consortium and they provide trainings also in basic ethics research. So yung mga students namin, pinapa-attend namin and they receive their certificates. So that's our practice po at the moment. How about po for Dr. Delosa? Is, are you here po? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm good, uh, ma'am. Yes, I'm ma'am. listening also from our experts this afternoon and learning. Uh, they're so advanced already with the practice. So I'm okay. taking down notes. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, yeah, yeah, ma'am. This is also a sort of benchmarking din po no, among the, the, the good practices po of the other institutions. Right. And, right uh, yes po, ma'am. How about po, ma'am, for CBSUA po? Dr. Ramirez? Hello. Good afternoon again. For the case of CBSUA, we have this what we call lecture series, CND lecture here series, which we have started several years back. And we are sponsoring several lectures, uh, seminars uh, related to the dissemination of related information for the conduct of research that are necessary, like research that includes research ethics. We also do some lectures on the publication. We also do some lectures on the production of results and uh, some lecture on the common and accepted protocol, the conduct of agriculture-related researches, especially so that CBSUA is uh, catering into uh, agriculture-related researchers being an agricultural university. Um, yeah, that's all okay. that we can share for CBSUA. Okay, po. And uh, due to the, the interest of time, po, I'm just going to ask one final question because from all the presentations earlier, I have noticed this is a, as a recurring problem about the, the workload of the REC members. So how does everyone po, resolve the concern for workload crediting of REC members? Do they get po, a reduced teaching load or do they get an administrative load or do they get po, an honorarium? for their work as a member of the REB? Can we start po with you, Dr. Ramirez? Um, I am currently looking at, please give me a few minutes to look at the, in, or what is placed in, ah, okay. in, okay. in our uh, in our operations manual. I have to review okay. muna. 
and what will be what is being given the special okay. committees. How about po for the case of USC, sir? Um, how do you so resolve what the concern for workload crediting of the REC members? Uh, sa USC. Apo, yes, po, sir. Uh, sa USC, only the chair. No? I am the only one deloaded. No? So uh, mm -hmm. I am deloaded uh, for uh, uh, six units. Because uh, at USC, the full is actually uh, 24 units. Uh, that's the full load. And then uh, six units deloading. Uh, for right, the other members do not do not have the loading, okay. But uh, they receive an honorarium you now for uh, doing the uh, review. But the honorarium is actually uh, just uh, very uh, uh, small you now. But they are happy to do it. They just to have students. But I, as the chair you now of the uh, committee, you now I do not uh, get the honorarium you now because actually the two hundred forty plus. Uh, protocols now uh, i am the first one to uh, really read them and then i am the one assigning now those protocols now to the reviewers now whether it is because it's a chair that determines whether it is for exempt uh, exempted for review or expedited or full so that's why only the chair is uh, given uh the kind of uh, deloading that's how we do it at usc okay yes paul uh -huh. the yes okay based on my um, review of the operations manual, a corresponding honorarium is given to the chairperson and the members respectively. 2000 for the chairperson and 1500 for the members of the special committees uh, per participation in any activities and that includes the reviews of different uh, proposals for, for the ethics uh, for the for, for ethics and research and uh, they are also given certification for the service how about for the case of this uh, uh, yes for the case of Visaya State University um uh, we consider the load as just a membership of a committee. So in this case, the uh, chair is given three units uh, workload for this, and then the members receive one unit workload. And then um, we receive honorarium based on the uh, fees we collect. So those who will be participants of the review for that paper will equally divide the uh, uh, the amount received for that uh, review per paper. So yun po yung, yung policy namin sa, uh, in terms of the honorarium and so workload credit po. Okay, po How about Dr. Manuel? Are you here po? How about for yes, po. Uh, for UPLB currently po, um, there is no administrative load credit yet and we would like to propose that for whoever the chair is going to be. So just like in the case of Dr. Suazo, we plan to have a three unit at least, uh, yeah, three unit uh, uh, admin load for the chair. So currently, po, we are just receiving, I just have, for, uh, as a chair, it's a committee unit. Committee work uh, load is just one unit. And because it's a university committee, it's one unit as chair. And I think it's just 0.5 or maybe 0.75 for the members. So, um, and then, um, supposed to be the members are going, the members who, who are doing the review should be able to get honorarium. And um, because we are starting yet, we have not received any honorarium and our OVICRE member, attorney, uh, Baby Linda La Cruz, is the one doing the computations for this initial review. But the chair is not uh, going to receive an honorarium because it's the members who are doing the review. So, yun po. So, baka nga po in the future, it's going to be an administrative load credit for the chair and the honoraria for the board members who will be doing the review. And it should be counted per review. Mm -hmm. And since we are currently not collecting any fees, so it's dependent on the rules that are currently set for uh, honoraria and committees and in UPLP. Okay. So, yun lang po. And lastly po, Dr. Delosa, for the case of NBSC, how do you po um, compensate po the members of the Research Ethics Board or Review Committee? 
Uh, that is still part, ma'am, of our negotiations and discussions regarding fees and compensation because well, whichever there, whenever there are amounts involved, we have really to ask permission from our BOT. Uh, yes, po, ma'am. I understand po that dilemma. So we have a lot of other questions here, po, that we will not be able to answer due to the interest of time. But rest assured for all our participants, for all our audience, um, who had uh, left out questions, we're going to collect these questions and send them out to our resource speakers and then send the their answers back to everyone. So thank you very much, Dr. Suazo, Dr. De Loza, Dr. Ramirez, Dr. De Los Santos, and Dr. Manuel for this very fruitful discussion. Medyo pitin po yung ating open forum, no? So next time po, mahabaan na po natin. So now we move on to the awarding of certificates of appreciation to our resource speakers and discussants. So let me read um, the contents of the certificates. So first is for our discussion. So this, this certificate of appreciation is awarded to Dr. Evelyn P. Serrano for serving as discussion in the roundtable webinar on research ethics held on 1st of December 2022. This event is part of the third international conference on governance and rural development of the UPLB College of Public Affairs and Development. Given this first day of December 2022 by the College of Public Affairs and Development, UP Los Baños. Signed, uh, Dr. Maria Cristina G. Alinsunurin, the ICDD3 Conference Chair. And of course, our Dean, Dr. Rowena D. T. Bacongis. So this one po is for our discussion. And next po, with the same contents, goes to our resource speakers. Um, first po is for Dr. Jovelin G. De Losa from the Northern Bukidnon State College. Thank you very much, ma'am, for accepting our invitation. And the same certificate po goes to Dr. Ruby S. Waso of the University of San Carlos. Thank you very much, sir, for all your insights. It's very helpful po for everyone po here, especially that USC has already an established research ethics board. And the next po is for Dr. Ramona Isabel S. Ramirez, ma'am. Thank you very much. I know that you're busy. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And to Dr. Janet Alexis Aparillo de los Santos, thank you very much, ma'am. And finally, to uh, UPLB's O, Dr. Carmina Manuel, thank you very much po for accepting po our invitation po for this afternoon. Um, ayun po, moving forward po, i-email ko po ulit kayo for all the questions that were left unanswered. And thank you very much po in advance po for answering them. Okay, so... Now, thank you very much once again. Before we move on to the next part of our program, may I invite po our research speakers and our panelists to please open po our cameras for a quick photo opportunity po for documentation purposes. So, um, let me check po. Okay. So, our tech team, are you ready po to take the photo? So we only have po one panel here. So one, two, three. Okay, po. Another one, po. Okay, po. Thank you very much, po, everyone, once again. And now we move. Nipa po tayo to pause. We move on to the next part of our program. As I have mentioned earlier, the pre-conference activities po for ICDD3 started with a student research poster contest. So this started in October. And now we are awarding po the winners. So we have invited enrolled students, graduate and undergraduate to submit research posters in the field of governance, extension, education, agriculture, community development, community health, and gender. So all of the submissions po were uploaded um, in the ICDD3 Facebook page. So we, have, we will be giving awards to the top three submissions under the completed research categories and the ongoing research categories. And we also have a People's Choice Awards, which was based on the number of likes each submission garnered. So let me first um, move to the People's Choice Awards. So before announcing the top three, so the People's Choice Award is a submission garnered the most likes and shares in Facebook from November 2022 until November 2028. And this award goes to um, developing a payment for ecosystem services scheme for waterfalls conservation and protection 
In Lagonay Camarines or Philippines Cost Benefit and Willingness to Pay Analysis submitted by Mr. Ariel N. Delfino, Mr. Emmanuel A. Onsai, and Mr. Kevin C. Baltar. So congratulations po to our authors for receiving the People's Choice Award. So now we move on to the top three. Um, so the top three in each of the categories were based on the following criteria. So we have um, the presentation of research, 40 points, a visual presentation, another 40 points, documentation and quality of sources, 10 points, and spelling and grammar, 10 points. So for the third place and the ongoing research, so the third place garnered an average score of 91, and this goes to Palaisdaan Palaisipan, a study on the impacts of climate change and high food prices, the fishing productivity of Barangay Malinta, um, submitted by Ses Lorian Evangelista and Ms. Victorious Louise Lualhati. So I hope the authors are here with us in Zoom. So congratulations to our third place winner. So now we move on to the second place garnered, who garnered an average score of 92. So this is a very close call between the third place and the second place winner. Po, no? And this goes to how urban spaces innovate technological innovations in urban-based fishing communities by Ms. Bianca Claudette R. Canlas. So congratulations, Ms. Canlas, for garnering the second place under the ongoing research category. And finally, for the first place, the first place got an average score of 94, and this goes to Itik Nawala's take knowledge and attitude towards adoption of new dock breed among small-scale dock racers in Victoria, Laguna, by Cyril Estimado and Mr. Elmer L. Delen. So congratulations po to all of the winners under the ongoing research category. So now we move on to the completed researches. So for the completed re researches, we actually got um, 11 submissions. So the third place uh, received an average score of 95. Um, and this goes to an analysis of vote buying culture among the four peace beneficiaries of Los Baños Laguna and its role in the exercise of fair and free political elections using the public choice theory. So this was submitted by Ms. Hannah Angela Kilioy, Hannah Cristea, Therese Agabao, and Ms. Cheska May Marsha. So congratulations to this group of students. And for the second place, so this got an average score of 96. And this goes to Land Suitability and Limitations Assessment for Sugarcane Cultivation in Quezon Province Using Geographical Information System. Submitted by Salvo O. Salvacion, Cheryl B. Bundalian, and Venice Lawrence and Cosico. So congratulations for the second place winner. And finally, for our top placer under the completed researches, the last but not the least, um, garnering an average score of 97 points, the first place winner goes to Environmental Attitudes of Local Government Scholars in Chaong Quezon, Philippines. This is submitted by the undergraduate Justin A. Marasigan and um, the late Dr. Maria Larisa Lelupigat. So congratulations, everyone, to our winners. So for your cash prizes and for your tokens, we are going to get back to you through your email soon. So thank you very much once again for um, submitting to the student research poster competition. So, okay, and that's it po for our program this afternoon. Um, thank you very much for joining this pre-conference activity, the roundtable webinar on research ethics. So I hope everyone learned something this afternoon from our esteemed resource speakers and discussants. Um, also, once again, let me take this opportunity to invite everyone to participate in the upcoming third international conference 
on governance and development, which will be held on July 2023. So the call for ABSAC will be up really soon. So watch out for announcement that will be posted in the ICDD3 official Facebook page. So thank you very much, Paul, once again. So we still have other pre-conference activities. So watch out for further announcements. So to secure your certificates of participation, kindly accomplish the evaluation form that could be accessed through the link provided and you could also scan the QR code. So uh, may I ask if the winners of the Student Research Poster conference, Contest is, a, is here with us in Zoom? Can you raise your hands po? So we could have po, a photo opportunity with the student winners. Um, for the certificate of participation, po, the link is provided po in the screen po earlier. Okay, po. So everyone, po, for the student winners, may I invite you, po, to uh, let me upgrade po everyone, po, to panelists. Um, sino pong available? Um, can you open po your microphones so I would know po who is here? Hello po. Hello po. Ah, hello po, Sir Marasigan. Congratulations on getting the first place under completed researches. So, any other Thank participants so po here? Um, wala na po atang na andito. So, but rest assured po that we have, we have invited po all of the winners. So, baka po nagsialisa na po sila. So, um, let me have po a photo po with our top placer under the completed research. Uh, let me take a photo po, everyone. So, one, two, and another one po. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Mr. Justin Marasigan. Thank you very much po. And that's it po for our event this afternoon. Thank you very much po once again.